So today we're going to talk about how to study mitochondria either as isolated organelles, as isolated mitochondria, or within permeabilized cells or within permeabilized tissues. Now this is a more simplified situation in which you can study mitochondrial function and therefore allows you to look at mitochondria with a good focus on the organelle itself. So what you're doing when you're isolating mitochondria or permeabilizing cells and tissues is that you have a lot more control over mitochondrial microenvironment. You can actually add substrates or add ions, add other things, and know that they're going to directly interact with mitochondria. You don't have a cell membrane, for example, separating your additions from the organelle you're studying. Because of this simplified situation, you can really quantify mitochondrial processes very specifically. So this is a condition in which you can quantify in millivolts, for example, the mitochondrial inner membrane potential, which might be difficult to do with mitochondria within intact cells or intact tissues, as we will talk about later. This is a situation in which you have a less complex condition, and therefore you're going to have a, loss, a lot less artifacts. But you always have to remember that this is not the situation of real life. So under these conditions, you can determine mitochondrial maximal respiration, maximal activity. You can determine how much mitochondria can make of ATP from a specific substrate. You can determine how much calcium mitochondria can take up or how fast mitochondria take up this calcium. But you cannot determine how much calcium mitochondria are taking up, taking up within an intact cell, or how much respiration is happening within an intact cell, because this is not an intact cell. This is an isolated mitochondrial situation. So these conditions are really good to understand mechanisms and pinpoint changes in mitochondrial function that can be, re be responsible for things that you see in real life. And actually, it's really elegant when you manage to join experiments that look at mitochondrial function in situ with experiments that look at mitochondrial function within permeabilized cells or isolated mitochondria that look for the mechanisms that explain the differences that you see in situ. So it's really interesting to join these two approaches and we'll see how to measure mitochondrial function in situ in the fourth, less, the fourth uh, class of this series. So Things to remember when you're isolating mitochondria. First, how to isolate mitochondria. To isolate mitochondria, you first have to break the cells. And here it really depends how you're going to break the cells on the type of cells that you're using. So if you're using tissues that are very hard or cells that have a cell wall, for example, sometimes you need to treat these tissues or these cells with enzymes that break down this first barrier. Uh, you can also use a series of different homogenizers. There are all sorts of different homogenizers around. Um, some homogenizers are just simply mechanical homogenizers. Uh, they're, sim they're pretty similar to a multiprocessor that you have in the kitchen, um, but much smaller in scale. And also homogenizers that use distances between the homogenizer and a glass vessel, for, ex for example. You can have a Teflon homogenizer or a glass homogenizer, which are going to break down these cells. And here it's really important, you have to break down the cell so that you remove these organelles from these cells. Another way to break down cells that can be really interesting is nitrogen cavitation. Nitrogen cavitation is interesting because it breaks the cell from the inside out, and it's also going to permeabilize the cell only once through this cavitation, and therefore you might conserve mitochondrial function much better under these conditions. So really, depending on what kind of mitochondria you're isolating, you have to look at what's the best way to break down the cells and liberate these mitochondria from these cells. After that, to isolate mitochondria, basically what you do is differential centrifugation. Typically, you're going to have a slower centrifugation first, which is going to separate debris and large organelles such as nuclei. And then faster uh, speed centrifugation, faster G, uh, higher G, in which you're going to separate the mitochondrial fraction predominantly. You could also further purify these mitochondria after you've precipitated these mitochondria and resuspended them through gradient separations, for example, through percol gradients. 
This may be necessary if you need very pure mitochondria, and you do have to be aware of the fact that differential centrifugation may bring contaminants of organelles that are similar in size to mitochondria. And specifically, contamination with peroxisomes is a problem in tissues that have lots of peroxisomes. For example, in liver mitochondria, you will have a lot of uh, peroxisome contamination unless you do a further purification with gradients. So it depends on what you need and if you really do need this very purified mitochondrial fraction or not. Uh, so this is isolated mitochondria. But there's another way to study mitochondria within cells, which is really interesting, which is permeabilizing the plasma membrane of the cell or the tissue and looking at these mitochondria inside these permeabilized cells or tissues. This is really interesting because you need a lot less tissue to do this. You don't lose any mitochondria with this differential centrifugation, so you can use a lot less starting tissue. And it's also interesting because the cells are going to be within, the mitochondria are going to be within the cells. So they're going to have their architecture conserved, but you're going to be able to access these mitochondria directly within the permeabilized tissue. To permeabilize cells or uh, tissues, you have to use enzymatic digestion sometimes. Um, not all cells or tissue require enzymes to be broken down. Usually you have to break down with enzymes when you're using a type of cell that has a cell wall. For example, yeast cells require this treatment first so that you can break them down. Um, and permeabilized cells and tissues use specifically detergents. Now the idea here is that you're going to use a selective detergent that's going to work mostly with lipids that mitochondria don't have. And the idea comes from work done by Gary Fiskum and Albert Leninger's lab, in which they noticed that digitonin, which interacts mainly with cholesterol, will selectively permeabilize the plasma membrane, but will not permeabilize mitochondrial membranes, because mitochondria are actually quite poor in cholesterol. So the, the, the use of digitonin is really the use that has been used for many years to permeabilize cells and study mitochondria in situ. After these studies, more recently, other detergents have uh, been shown to also be adequate to study cells, uh, to study mitochondria within permeabilized cells. Uh, these other detergents sometimes by some companies are sold as being selective and not to require any kind of titration. I don't believe that. I think you always have to titrate your detergent. That's a really important point here because any selective detergent is going to permeabilize mitochondria at some point. So when you're permeabilizing tissues, make sure to use different quantities of detergent and look at markers of plasma membrane permeabilization versus markers of mitochondrial intactness and choose the lowest concentration of detergent that permeabilizes the plasma membrane but still maintains mitochondria intact. This is really important to have a good study of mitochondria within permeabilized cells or tissues. The advantage of doing permeabilized tissue or permeabilized cell experiments is that a cytoskeleton with permeabilization with digitonin, this has been very clearly shown, is maintained. So mitochondrial architecture is more conserved versus studied with studies with isolated mitochondria in which mitochondrial architecture is really not conserved. Um, the advantage also is that when you permeabilize the plasma membrane, you're diluting infinitely the cytoplasmic components that are soluble in water. So you're going to have the organelles there, and you're going to have anything that's bound to membranes there, but all the enzymes that are water-soluble and all uh, the intermediates of metabolic pathways and the cytosol are going to be diluted infinitely. So they really are not going to be working these, these mechanisms that are cytosol. To study isolated mitochondria and permeabilized cells and tissues, the last thing you have to remember is the kind of environment that you're incubating your mitochondria or your permeabilized cells and tissues. The experimental media you use must be similar to intracellular environments. So it should have a slightly more acidic pH compared to the pH you use to culture cells because you generate acid within cells, you generate CO2 through metabolism, so inside the cell tends to be more acidic than outside the cell. Uh, 
Another characteristic of media that you have to keep in mind is that it should have very, very low calcium. And this is because calcium concentrations within cells are 10,000 times lower than calcium concentrations outside the cells. In fact, calcium concentration within cells are so low, around 100 nanomolar, that your normal water, your millicule water, has much more calcium than you expect inside the cell. Millicule water can have between 5 and 10 micromolar calcium in good purified millicule water. So what you have to do is use chelators to eliminate this excess calcium from your water. And this is really important when you're studying mitochondria that take up calcium, such as mammalian mitochondria, because 10 micromolar calcium can be quite toxic to mitochondria, so very low calcium. You should have high potassium, such as an intracellular media is expected to have, and you should have low sodium. So you should give preference to potassium salts to pH your media to buffer anything that you're using versus sodium salts. This is different from what you do with intact cells. Finally, you need some kind of osmotic support. And this can be all sorts of things. Quarter molar sucrose is used a lot. 150 millimolar KCL is also used a lot. And you do see lots of people using half and half between sucrose and KCL, sort of to maintain potassium concentrations similar to the concentrations you would find within a cell. Under some situations, you may also want to give some kind of oncotic support. This can either be protein or some kind of sugar. Um, that depends really on what you want to study and if you want this oncotic support in your medium. Finally, if you want oxidative phosphorylation to work, you need to add magnesium and you need to add phosphate. Also, you have to use mitochondrial substrates. You cannot give glucose to a permeabilized cell or to isolated mitochondria because glycolysis doesn't work. You have to give pyruvate or you have to give glutamate or you have to give malate, succinate, substrates that mitochondria can take up and use in order for phosph oxidative phosphorylation to work. And here a really important point is that these substrates are typically quite acid. So make sure to check their pH and buffer their pH, preferably with potassium, before you add them to mitochondria. A common problem in isolated mitochondrial studies is that people will add pyruvate without buffering their pH, and they're actually putting their pH down to 3 in their experimental media, and then mitochondria don't work anymore. Finally, a question you should think about when studying isolated mitochondria is what temperature to do your experiments. You will often see people doing isolated mitochondrial studies of mammalian mitochondria at temperatures that are much lower than you would expect mammalian mitochondria to work in physiologically, so at 28 or 30 degrees Celsius. People do this because oxidative phosphorylation actually works a lot better at these temperatures. You have a lot more coupling, and this is considered a better mitochondrial preparation. However, these are not the conditions that mitochondria within their original cells would be. Mammalian mitochondria would typically be at 37 degrees. So uh, in my lab, we tend to do experiments at 37 degrees, even though you will get lower respiratory control ratios, for example, at these temperatures. But this is something you have to think about, and also think about the origin of your mitochondria and what temperature that organism lives best at. Actually, there is data now in the literature that mitochondria may be the hottest part of the cell um, with temperatures that are above 37 degrees. So maybe we should be doing experiments at even hotter temperatures than that. So that's what I wanted to talk about, about the conditions in which you're going to study isolated mitochondria and permeabilized cells, and also when to study isolated mitochondria and permeabilized cells. I'll come back in the next video in which I'll give you an overview of, of the proton circuit and how oxidative phosphorylation works, and then we'll talk about how to measure oxidative phosphorylation in isolated mitochondria and permeabilized systems. Bye.